to the delight of Phillies fans everywhere, the 2022 season saw the return of the traditional Philly Fanatic costume. In response to a dispute with the creators of the Fanatic, Harrison and Erickson, the Phillies had unveiled a newly designed Fanatic just two seasons prior. While the core of the lovable green creature from the Galapagos Islands remained unchanged, there were slight differences that many Phillies fans noticed right away. This included a change to the snout, a star around the eyebrows, some scales along the wings, a more svelte appearance, and a larger derriere. And while the changes were subtle, many Phillies fans were not fond of the new design. Although it may be easy to deride the creation of the modified fanatic, the fact is this modified fanatic was actually quite genius when considered on a legal and strategic analysis. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. On this channel, we talk about the history of baseball from the A's to the Phillies to the 19th century. And sometimes we talk about contemporary baseball issues. So if you love baseball and if you love Philadelphia, stick around and subscribe to our channel. Our heroes. They were given a special place of honor in our cathedrals to glory. You too can honor your heroes of your youth just go to PhiladelphiaBaseballHistory.com. The Philly Fanatic. He's that green, lovable mascot. We Philly fans, we think he's the greatest mascot in all sports. He's funny. He's been around since 1978. And believe it or not, when I was a child, I went to the first game where the Fanatic was introduced in April of 1978. Six-year-old me went with my parents. We would go to ball games often. I mean, I practically grew up at Veterans Stadium with my parents taking me to Phillies games. So I saw the Fanatic as he was uh, introduced and I went to a number of his birthday games. I want to talk about uh, this litigation over the copyright regarding the Philly Fanatic. And let's do a little background because this, this is a very interesting, fascinating case to me uh, because it, it shows something very strange, at least the way I see it, about the operation of copyright law in the United States. As an aspect of U.S. copyright law, those creators who have sold the copyright in their creation are permitted to reclaim ownership of the copyright 35 years after they have sold it. Harrison and Erickson relied on this provision of U.S. law to give notice to the Phillies that they intended to reclaim the copyright of the Philly fanatic. This aspect of U.S. copyright law is meant to address the situation where the creators of a certain piece of artistic expression had sold the copyright and then later realized that the creation had greater value. Paul McCartney and John Lennon of the Beatles, for example, transferred the copyright of all the Beatles songs to a publishing company early in the Beatles' career. With the Beatles becoming one of the most popular bands in rock and roll, this worked to the detriment of Lennon and McCartney. The ability to reclaim the ownership of a copyright would have benefited Lennon and McCartney greatly. What follows is an attempt to explain the litigation surrounding the Philly Fanatic and why the modified Fanatic costume was such a stroke of genius. Now, I am a trained lawyer. And I found the press coverage of the litigation surrounding the Philly Fanatic to be, well, lacking. I will admit, however, that I am not a copyright lawyer. And because of that, my analysis of the litigation, well, it may have some flaws and it may not be 100% accurate. And for that reason, if there is a copyright lawyer who watches this video, I welcome you to comment below in any inaccuracies or misunderstandings that I may mention in this video. Back in 1978, the Philly Fanatic was introduced. Uh, back then, Bill Giles, who eventually became the president of the Phillies' uh, baseball operations, back then he was in charge of promotions. And he, he kind of uh, grew tired of the, the, the Phillies' old mascots, Phil and Phyllis. They were the constitutional, the, uh, the colonial looking characters. Uh, children they were supposed to look like, uh, dressed in colonial garb, that, uh, represented the Phillies, Phil and, and Phyllis. And he wanted to update that, so he 
wanted to come up with the new mascot. Uh, initially, he contacted Jim Henson. Jim Henson uh, got him in contact with another uh, creator who Henson used to work with in order to create his characters, Harrison Erickson. The company was known as Harrison Erickson. And uh, uh, Giles uh, contracted with Harrison Erickson to create the Philly Fanatic. He gave him some general ideas. I want this big, fat, green creature uh, that roots for the Phillies to be really silly but lovable. And based on that, they came up with the design, gave the Phillies a costume. So the Phillies assigned one of their employees, Dave Raymond, to become the Philly Fanatic. And Dave Raymond injected a lot of his own personality into the character and basically established the character of the Philly Fanatic, the lovable character that I grew up with and that is still used today. Even though Raymond is retired, there have been a number of people who have been inside the costume. They have been trained to personalize, to bring alive the Philly Fanatic in the same personality that Dave Raymond created with. By operation of law, you know, understanding some, some copyright. When you contract an independent contractor to create something for you, the contractor, the independent contractor, owns the copyright of that creation. That's how the basic um, common law of copyright works. Now, if it were an employee, if it was somebody who was in the Phillies uh, employment who created the Philly Fanatic, then the Phillies would have owned the copyright. And for whatever reason, the Phillies did not alter that by contract. Maybe they wanted to see if the Fanatic would be successful, and if he wasn't successful, well, if they didn't own the contract, or if they didn't own the copyright, they wouldn't be making much of a risk. So the creators still owned the copyright back in 1978. At the time, Bill Giles chose not to purchase the copyright of the Fanatic along with the costume, which would have cost the Phillies $5,200. Instead, opting to purchase only the costume at a price of $3,900. Later, Giles would understand that this decision was a critical mistake. Between 1978 and 1984, Fanatic became wildly popular. Wildly popular. Uh, he's now a cash cow for the Phillies and is still wildly popular after 40 some years. And, uh, but between 78 and 84, it became wildly popular. The Phillies um, capitalized on that. They had Fanatic toys. They had Fanatic on uh, the Fanatic on their pennants. They had books, children's books about the Philly Fanatic. They marketed, they really merchandised the Philly Fanatic. And there was some dispute about how the Phillies were using him. And um, Harrison Erickson did file some litigation back then. However, the litigation was settled in 1984. And the Phillies wound up purchasing the copyright of the Fanatic then. Seeing how popular the Fanatic became, Harrison Erickson decided to take advantage of that provision of U.S. copyright law and inform the Phillies that they wanted to take the copyright back 35 years after they had sold it. Which would mean that the Phillies would no longer own the copyright to the Philly Fanatic. And this created a huge uproar. In fact, there was a lot of publicity about, oh, the Fanatic might become a free agent, they might shop them around to other teams. But that was the thing that hit the news way back 2018, 2019. Oh my goodness, somebody else could win the Fanatic. So the Phillies, um, yeah, they, they panicked a little bit, uh, but they also, what they did is um, they decided that they were going to create or uh, alter the Fanatic. So <clears throat> they changed the way the Fanatic looked a little bit. Uh, they changed the around his eyes. It would, you know, like his, I guess you would call them his eyelashes or his eyelids were kind of oval shaped and now they were star shaped. They made the Fanatic a little bit skinnier, but they gave him a bigger butt. They changed his feathers on his tail. They gave him these weird scales on his arm and they changed his snout. His snout was like a conical snout and they changed it to more of a straight snout and uh, basically said, okay, we, we had a hand in creating this character. We don't think you have the right to take him away. We're just going to use this new fanatic as we have created him uh, and we're going to ignore 
your, um, uh, your termination of our assignment in the copyright. And at the same time, the Phillies filed a lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District for the Southern District of New York uh, in order to uh, make the claim that either the, uh, the creators could not terminate the, uh, the copyright or that the Phillies had some rights in the fanatic copyright uh, and that the Phillies had the right to use it. They wanted that kind of a, a judgment and that case went to the, the district court. Now, we've got a decision that came out in August. It's a decision on summary judgment. Now, let me do a little explanation of, of uh, procedure here because <clears throat> that's one of the things that I find was missing in the media coverage is an understanding of the procedure. Um, when a case gets filed in a U.S. district court, it gets assigned to a U.S. district judge. But U.S. district judges, well, they're overworked. They have a huge caseload. So what they tend to do is they have magistrates, which are, they're judicial officers. They're not quite judges, but they are judicial officers. And they're empowered to do things to help out the trial judge. So the trial judge could concentrate on uh, the, the trial judge's other cases, his bigger cases, where his attention is needed and the magistrate can deal with some other issues. And in this case, a magistrate judge was assigned the role of giving recommendations on this motion for summary judgment. Now, what is a motion for summary judgment? Basically, a motion for summary judgment is where the parties uh, either agree or where it is shown that there's no genuine issue of triable fact, meaning that most of the facts are known. Most of the facts are known and you don't need to put on witnesses to explain how the fanatic got there. They don't need to explain the past litigation, who owns the copyright, and, and this makes a lot of sense. A lot of this stuff is, is established. The, the Phillies in 84 bought the, the copyright uh, to the Philly fanatic and now it's 35 years later. They did some changes. All that is a matter of public record to the fanatic's costume and the owners um, want to take back, or the creators, I should say, want to take back the copyright. So that's all uh, a matter of, you know, that there's not much there to, to contest. That's why we're on summary judgment. And this is a judgment that would be issued based entirely on the application of the law. So let's get into the law. Let's get into uh, basically a summary of what the judge said and what this means, both for the Phillies and for uh, the, the creators going forward. First, the Phillies made a claim that they were, had, or they had some rights in the copyright of the fanatic, that the fanatic was more than just a, a statue or a costume, that it was a character, and that the Phillies, because there was input from Bill Giles 40 years ago, because of the way that Dave Raymond characterized the fanatic, uh, that they had a role in creating the character and therefore they should be uh, they should be recognized as having some ownership rights over the copyright of the character. So the magistrate said you can have a copyright in a character. However, in this case, the judge did not think that what the Phillies contributed to the Philly fanatic really was uh, significant enough to allow the Phillies to have ownership of parts or at least a partial ownership of a copyright over the character. And, and you know, think about it. Uh, take James Bond. Ian Fleming wrote a number of James Bond novels and he developed the James Bond character over that series of novels so that uh, Ian Fleming had a copyright in the character of James Bond that he could then sell that copyright to the character to a movie company, a movie studio like Sony. Sony, I believe, now owns uh, or at least has a license to use the James Bond character in their films. So the magistrate judge did not think that the Phillies contributed enough in order to have a copyright in the character of the Philly fanatic. So let's then move on to the next issue, which is it involves derivative works. Now let's take a step back, talk to you about derivative works, what that means. Um, when you create something, you create a piece of art or some other copyrightable object, thing. Uh, you, you have the right not only to that thing, but also to all 
derivative works, like uh, George Lucas. He uh, created Star Wars. His film, his company, Lucasfilms, owns, or at least at well, yeah, they, they still own it, but Lucasfilm is owned by Disney. So Lucasfilms owns Star Wars uh, and all the stories. Well, a derivative, right, would be, for example, somebody who wrote a novel using all the Star Wars characters in the Star Wars uh, universe and just creating, you know, a, a completely different novel, another story set in the same time period. That would be a derivative work. Um, if you think about uh, the Muppets, there was a show back in the 90s, I think, that was called Muppet Babies, where they took the Muppets and they changed them a little bit and they made them younger and they made them babies. Muppet Babies, that was a derivative work from the Muppets. Well, a copyright holder has the right to derivative works, and in particular, a derivative work that they create. And there's this interesting hiccup in copyright law where if you have one of these uh, creators who terminates the contract after 35 years, well, the copyright holder for those 35 years still has, the, you know, they, they created a derivative work during those 35 years, and now the copyright has been uh, terminated, their ownership and the copyright has been terminated, they still have the ownership of the derivative works that they created. So the Phillies were making a claim that the current Fanatic was a derivative work of the original Fanatic. That yes, they had the Fanatic from 1984. That version of the Fanatic is what is the subject of the copyright termination. And that the changes that they made to the Fanatic in between, 19, or between 2019 and 2020, when they added the stars to the eyes and the weird things to the uh, to the arms and changed his body and changed his snout, that that was a derivative work that thou, now the Phillies had proper ownership of, regardless of what happened to the 1984 version. And the court agreed. Yeah, you, you made sufficient changes that it was a derivative work, but at the same time, we can still recognize this as, a, as the Philly fanatic. It's a derivative work. The Phillies created that derivative work while they still had the copyright. They own the rights to that derivative work. And now that you have, uh, you the creator, have terminated the assignment of the copyright, okay, you get what you had in 1984. You don't get the derivative works that the Phillies created. And that's what the, um, uh, the magistrate judge ruled on that issue. And then the final issue, was it proper to terminate? Did they, uh, the, the creators properly terminate? And the, the judges, the, the magistrate basically said, yeah, there's a proper termination. So uh, uh, the, the creators own the copyright to the Philly Fanatic as it existed in 1984. But as Harrison and Erickson very likely realized, ownership in the copyright of the traditional fanatic alone did not have much marketable value. The copyright in the traditional fanatic did not include the ability to use Philly's trademarks, such as the uniform or the P logo. And this meant that the market for the very recognizable green character was very likely limited to only the Phillies themselves. With this major victory in a summary judgment motion, the Phillies had a powerful piece of leverage. While many fans responded negatively to the modified aspects of the Philly Fanatic costume, the fact is the Fanatic's antics remained popular. And because the Phillies owned this modified Fanatic as a derivative work, the Phillies had shown that they could use the modified Fanatic and still entertain fans. Thus, there was not an impending need for the return of the traditional Fanatic. And with this greater leverage, the Phillies negotiated a settlement with Harrison Erickson that allowed the Fanatic to return to Citizens Bank Park. The exact terms of that settlement have remained confidential. And this meant that the version of the Philly Fanatic that the fans had come to love so much will remain a staple of Phillies baseball for the foreseeable future. Special thanks to our patron, Ray Easterday. You too can support this channel by going over to patreon.com. Also check out our merch store, 
at PhiladelphiaBaseballHistory.com. We'll have all relevant links in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching.